having a blast in 2012. This has been a fantastic turnout, to say the least. Paul Stanford and, and his crew outdid themselves. You hear the crowd in the background having fun, and it's just been another success. And we've had a, a great list of ma amazing speakers, and one of the speakers that made it a point to come out to the uh, event today has a long history with the hemp movement, has written a handful of amazing books, has some great tapes out, and also does a radio show, but also happens to be living in a state where uh, medical marijuana is allowed in the state of Michigan. His name is John Sinclair, one of my heroes uh, and somebody who has uh, a long history with this. You were arrested, weren't you, at one time uh, for possession? Is that what the deal was? Several times. And uh, you ended up behind bars because of it, huh? Yes, well, mostly because I fought back. Well, now, was it a large amount? Is that what it was? Or is it a small amount and you just said, I ain't taking it? Well, I had a series of three arrests. And the first one, I sold $10 worth of weed to an undercover state police officer. And the second one, I let a guy who turned out to be a Detroit narcotics officer wow. talk me into letting him drive me to a guy's house, and I went in and got him a bag of weed. And the third one, I gave two joints to an undercover police woman. And the third one, I got a nine and a half to ten year sentence in the state of Michigan. Man, you got the kind of sentence that some drug kingpins get. Oh yeah, more. And and that's what was that that's what it was that drew the attention of a handful of uh, organizations in the in uh, the marijuana movement to come to your side. Is that what it was? Well, I was. I don't like to say this to swell my head, but I was one of the founders of the marijuana movement, legalization movement. I came right after Allen Ginsberg and Edward Sanders back in 1965. Okay. So I was already, I was attacked by the police mostly for being an advocate of marijuana legalization. Also, I was the manager of a rock and roll band called the MC5. And we were against the war and we were against the government and all these things. So I was a political prisoner. I was actually recognized by Amnesty International as a political prisoner of the United States. Wow. Yeah. And that says and a I lot. was. And that says a lot because during that time our country was taking pride in, in, in the way they treated their citizens with freedom. So for, for one of our citizens to be on Amnesty's list really spoke volumes. Allen Ginsberg did that for me. Absolutely. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. The great Allen Ginsberg. I love it. Hero. <laughs> so, and uh, then uh, you ended up having a handful of celebrities nice enough to take time out of their busy schedule to come and raise some uh, awareness for your cause. Well, Casper, this was before the celebrity culture. These were people who were fellow musicians and activists. Okay. Who managed to also have hit records. You could do both at that time. All right. <laughs> now you, you can. You didn't have to sign everything over to get your million, you know? <laughs> yeah, because now even when you watch MTV, they pixel out the marijuana leaves. Yeah. <laughs> well, that doesn't even go into the... They pay them large amounts of money for not having characters in films and television productions smoke marijuana. No, I didn't know that. You didn't know that? I didn't know that. True that. Like a movie script, they'll pay them a million or two million dollars not to have any drugs in it. Wow. And television, they give them an exemption from their PSA allowance. You know, every station has to right. run some public service announcements right. without pay. Well, they'll trade them up to like a million dollars worth of PSA time that they don't have to run, time that they can instead sell. All right. For not having drugs. So, no, so it so. isn't an accident, you know. Uh -huh, okay. But on the other hand, it's like Bill Hicks used to say, you know, if you're really against drugs, and people getting high. You better not watch any more movies, listen to any more records, <laughs> because all those people are high.
So it's all just this is ridiculous mythology. That I don't, I don't really understand Christianity, but they allege that it has its roots in the Christian concept. I don't see where, but they use this. Because to me, the whole marijuana prohibition in the U.S. is a religious. I was forced to conclude there was a religious issue. Okay. It's a religious issue. It doesn't have anything to do with logic. Well, no, it can't. To debate somebody about the marijuana laws, it's like debating the Virgin Mary. Either you believe or you don't, you know? Okay. No, There's you're right. no photo of the hymen. You know, I'm like saying? you. I've scratched my head. So how can somebody possibly believe that the a prohibition is good when you realize all, uh, the, all the things a plant can make? Right. Well, and the good things that it does for people and the medicinal values and as well as the, I, I don't know. I've always, I'm like, um, I'm missing myself. Jack no. Hare? No, Dennis. Oh, Dennis Perone? Dennis Perone. Thanks. I'm like Dennis Brown, I believe all marijuana use in America is medicinal because we live in a sick social order and marijuana helps us adjust and overcome this. I had I had I, the, find. I had the good fortune of working with Dennis Perone in the California Hemp Initiative ah. and he and Jack and Chris Conrad and Mickey Norris and yeah. Dr. Todd Micaria were working yeah. on that. And uh, I used to be in a morphia with Todd Micaria did forty you? years ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I got a couple of interviews with Dr. Todd, and I tell you, and the great Dr. Michael days. Aldrich. Never had a chance to meet Michael Aldrich. Yeah, that's my boy. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Now we both got our Lifetime Achievement Awards last year for my time. So oh, me and Mike. Congratulations! Uh, wow. Congratulations! Yeah. And uh, now you, you came with a cheap sweatshirt. Yeah. <laughs> You're one of the founders of the marijuana movement. I know Jack Harris, Captain Ed is. I have a, well, I what was it that got that, you involved? Jack came 20 years after me. Well, what got you involved? What was it that makes you? Well, I was a pilot. Okay. I mean, did, were, were you aware about the paper, fiber fuels, and the medications of it, or was it just the no. euphoric aspects of it that you that you liked? I was a poet and cultural presenter and organizer. And I smoked weed. That was the best thing that. So After peyote, it was the best thing that creativity? ever happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And just as a person. And then you found out that they had these enormous penalties for you if they caught you doing this. And it just, it, it was offensive to me, the whole concept of it. And then I got in trouble with the police getting busted, see? And then you were subjected to all the criminal penalties, not just the time, but the way they treat you, and the total stripping of your human rights, and locked in cells without, uh, you know, sexual companionship, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things, because you smoked weed and got high, it just was offensive to me, and still it. It's offensive. It makes me angry. I hate it. And I can't wait. I'm trying to live long enough to see it legalized. Well, it might happen here in Oregon. Now, you've also got to over the period of the Oregon, last... Oregon, Washington, Colorado, I'm praying. Yes, and the, if that happens, it'll be like the Berlin Wall coming down. Well, you'll probably remember Casper the Domino Theory. <laughs> Let's hope so. Now, you've written some books over the past few years, that's for sure. Although certain. I always got a kick out of the Domino Theory because it was about Southeast Asia. Oh. Right? Uh, well, originally, yes, Vietnam, it was. Vietnam, Laos, right? Cambodia. If one of them went, they don't. Well, China was already communist. Well, <laughs> Westmoreland, West, Westmoreland and Johnson felt for sure that's exactly what would happen, the yeah. domino effect. Yeah, well, the big domino had already fallen. <laughs> but anyway, you've written some books over the past uh, 20 years or so. 40 but, years. Well, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to be gracious, sir. Oh, no, no, I'm proud of my... Uh, you're proud of your path in life. It has been a long journey. I've been journey. smoking weed for 50 years. I've been writing poetry and, uh, and performing and also writing journalism, writing about music. Now, this book, Guitar the Army... the early 60s. This book, the, the, the book, Guitar Army, what's this about? Well, it's not about anything. <laughs> It's about the 60s. It was written in the 60s. 
It's about people like ourselves. It's about the movement, the uh, cultural revolution, to try and change America from an ugly, greedy place to the kind of world we want to live in, where people love each other and try to help each other. No, I've got to be honest. To I, put it in so many words. I really thought that generation, I mean, that was my older sister's generation, right. and with the Beatles and right. the hydroponics and, and all the Kennedy's attitude and, and, and Martin Luther right. King's dream right. that Martin by the Malcolm time X. you and I would find ourselves sitting here, we'd all have hydroponics food, the poor would be eating, we'd have, you know, a great clean the planet, we'd have fresh air to breathe, we'd have, you know, well, yeah. what happened? Well, what they, happened? We lost. We lost. I don't get it. And it turned to shit, just like what will happen here if they lose the marijuana initiative. Okay. It'll be ugly, because the other side is not a pretty bunch. I know, but love was supposed to conquer all. So far, it doesn't seem to have happened. Well, I don't know. It works on a personal level, don't you think? Sometimes, but it hasn't worked on a national stage. Now, you've also well, written this other groovy book, too. People called have got to embrace it. Man. You can't make somebody love somebody, you know. <laughs> well, that's true. And I've seen our political uh, and our Wall Street leaders, and they are kind of hard to embrace. Well, yeah, <laughs> and plus they got both their hands in your pockets. They sure do. <laughs> they sure do. And you've written this pretty groovy book too, called "Songs of Praise." And this Song is, these of are your, praise, yeah. These are your uh, uh, poems, is that right? Poems and writings centered on John Coltrane. Okay. Big influence Homage on to you. John Coltrane. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, then and that's the record that goes with it, where I perform the poem set to music. Groovy. See, what I really do, I write poems and then I set them to music. And then I perform them with musical ensembles. Nice. And I'm known as the hardest working poet in show business. Very nice. I'm going to light my cigarette. I know this is... That's all right. Well, you know... Uh, we want you to be at home, and, and we want people to meet you and know you as you are. So that's why we made a point to find you where you're having fun, and you're among friends, and you're relaxing. You're not in an uptight office someplace <laughs> with some CEO breathing down well, your neck. You won't find me there, <laughs> ever. No, but we will find you doing your radio show. I don't show. go there. We will find you doing your radio show that's going what? I'll be doing it right here, though. I do it on my laptop, All wherever right. I go. All right. My radio station, I got my own radio station called RadioFreeAmsterdam.com. All right. I put up an hour program, music program every day. And you can listen to my stream, and it's just like listening to a radio station. Only better. Only better. <laughs> I only play good records. Now, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be listening to this uh, long after you and I have long passed. Yeah, good. What, what message would you give to the future generations that happens to be listening to your words that you're speaking right now? Wow, it's hard to picture what their circumstances will be. Well, I figure but asking a poet, will my, I get a good answer? My basic preachment is do what you want to and don't do what you don't want to. Figure out what you want to do, figure out how to do it, and then do it. That's me. That's happiness to me. And for people sitting on the fence about ending prohibition, your statement to them would be? Give it up. There you go. And this has been a live broadcast that is now a film broadcast here in 2012 at the Portland Hempstock. And it has been an honor to be part of the group of THCF. And I want to say, say thank you to Paul Stanford and his amazing team for making not just this event possible, Absolutely, but for making it possible for John to be here, for myself to be here, and for making it possible to have on the on the ballot this year in 2012 here in Oregon.